good evening. Welcome to the, what, May 2023 uh, episode of Condig, uh, Central Ohio.net Developer Group. Thanks all for coming out. Uh, thanks all for those online or watching later on. Uh, we're happy to, hit, to, to, to have you here. Um, if you are not on our meetup, please join us. You can go to meetup.com, centralohio.net developer group, or uh, centralohio.net will also redirect you to this, which is nice and handy because I can't remember this. Uh, so join us and you'll get notification of the future events. Um, we are on YouTube with, wow, over 200 subscribers. That's nice and shiny. Pretty soon we're going to be able to monetize that sucker and uh, afford more. 235, actually. Ooh. Yeah, catching up with my channel. Uh, but yeah, we'll be able to, to afford some, some Diet Dr. Pepper for the organizers, it'll be nice. Uh, speaking of which, there are, there's pizza, there's free drinks. Uh, thank you for, for that, for improving. Um, help us conserve bandwidth. Don't be downloading uh, games, videos, whatever on your, on your devices. I don't think that should be a problem, but uh, just be courteous if you're going to be using your machine here. Uh, thank you again to Improving, not just for the food and drinks, but for hosting this, and it feels like almost every other user group in the, in the area here. Uh, we really appreciate Improving and their impact on Central Ohio and other tech communities. Um, they're really awesome. Uh, thank you again to uh, JetBrains for uh, sponsoring the raffle. I will be raffling off a license to any JetBrains product. It's good for a year. Things like ReSharper, Writer, WebStorm, PHP Storm, if you want to do PHP. Um, but we'll be raffling off a, a, a license at the end tonight. Uh, other groups in the area, Central Ohio Azure Group is a great group. Uh, they are still active. They are the second Monday of every month in the uh, Microsoft office, I guess, up at Polaris. I talked to Mike Collier uh -huh. last week. Yeah. He says this is not active, and the Microsoft shut down our office. Well, okay, so we have a fresh update. Our slides just got shorter. <laughs> However, the global app dev user group, they may have rebranded to the universal app dev user group, is still active. Um, that's being run by uh, some wonderful folks out there at uh, Progress Telerik, um, great group, uh, run by Sam. Uh, GlobalAppDevUserGroup.com, really good uh, one to check out if you're curious about that stuff. And then Columbus JS meets here on a semi-irregular basis. Uh, so uh, join that group that's also on Meetup. Um, those, those events are usually a whole lot of fun. And again, you know, free food and drink, which is nice. Uh, CBUS data, I'm pretty sure is still active, but I don't attend this one. Okay, I'm getting some nods, so thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, and they meet uh, the second Thursday of the month, which is nice. Uh, okay, so we have a lot of stuff on the calendar, which is great. Uh, this month we have uh, Cassandra talking about purposeful, uh, purposeful personal branding, which I did not practice saying aloud, and I'm now regretting. Uh, <laughs> Me too. Next month we have Mel Grubb talking about coding with others from a distance. Um, I myself will not be here for that one because I will be at a distance in KCDC uh, with Cassandra, actually. Um, but that should be a lot of fun talking about, uh, uh, was it uh, the... VS Live Edit, what's, what's the extension called? Uh, the Live Edit Capabilities of Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code. Uh, yeah, yeah, VS Live, yep, sorry. Uh, and then the following month, we're gonna have lightning talks. So we're gonna be reaching out and say, hey, who has something they'd like to talk about for, say, 10 minutes? Um, some interesting topic on various technologies remotely related to .NET. If you have something really cool, let's talk about it. So next month we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we'll tell, uh, Alan will tell you a little bit more about how to present and how to you know, opt in on that process. Uh, but I'm already thinking about what things I might be blabbering about. Um, we don't know what we're doing yet in August. We'll figure it out. Uh, hopefully we find somebody else so it's not just me filibustering about squirrels or something, which I often do. Uh, and then Barrett Blake, uh, who actually just watched another talk of his today, uh, but he's going to be talking to us about Blazor in September, in October. Alan, you're talking about something that's to be determined, uh, but probably not Blazor would be my guess. Um, and then, you know, we are always off November and December. So that's sort of what's coming up. Uh, should be exciting. I'm looking forward to this stuff. Uh, if you're looking to, uh, if you're looking to hire, please raise your hand. We've got a couple hands, three hands, so talk to these wonderful folks. They are wonderful folks, too. Um, if you're looking for a job, cool, go talk to these folks. Um, and also, today is really helpful for you just for the general stuff for finding that opportunity and presenting yourself well in a job interview on your resume, things like that. So really looking forward to this talk. Um, if you want to help us with what we're doing here, uh, talk to Alan, myself, or Sam about how you can help. We are always 
looking for new ideas and new blood and things like that. But mm -hmm. uh, that's all we got for the month. Uh, Cassandra, I will get the HDMI off of here and uh, get you all set up. And thank you again for speaking. Of course. I miss you. I don't know much. User groups are wonderful. That's how it works. I'm going to start. Okay, I should mention user groups. Are we ready to hook up or are we? It is. Rose. Yay, that's uh, a street in Portugal. The street was painted pink and there were um, rainbows <laughs> <laughs> above it, and it was just like, it's actually my profile picture on Instagram where it was. Cooperate with me, PowerPoint. I would appreciate that very much, and thank you. All right. All right, hey everybody, how you doing? Um, Matt said I'm Cassandra Ferris. I actually am really excited to be here giving this talk today. The first time I ever gave this talk, the logo down there wasn't casting. It was actually improving. Um, I used to work here in this office. I handled community outreach and talent management, and over time realized that my passion was. Um, developing people, growing people skills, and growing their careers and growing developer communities, but I wasn't so concerned about the hiring aspect of things. And so several years ago, I was at a meetup group and a friend of mine and I were talking and he's like, you should be a community manager. And I go, community manager is an actual job? So what a community manager is, is a lot of different things. Um, we work in developer relations and we're kind of the intersection between people who build products use products and buy products and like contribute to them. And so in my role, I do a little bit of marketing, I do a little bit of teaching, I do some moderation of open source contributors, a lot of different things that all tie back to my brand. I also, for my job, Kasten sends me literally all over the world to give talks. I've been in Amsterdam, Toronto, Athens, and London in the past five weeks. <laughs> and this had been a goal of mine. Like all of these things had been goals of mine, and it was a personal brand that got me here. So before we talk about all that, we're gonna throw this back to, maybe, why are we not? I promise I do this for a living, I don't know what to do. Would you want another remote? No, I think it's, it's just not advancing my slide. Oh no, there we are, we're good, Never mind. All right, anyway, um, so yeah, we're gonna, Throw it back to back in the early 2000s when I graduated college. And during college and shortly after, we relied on, did these icons look familiar to anybody? Good old ICQ, AOL Instant Messenger. Guessing most of you had it. So how many here when you had these things, did you ever like <coughs> have different font colors or change your buddy icon or do anything like that on your AOL profile? maybe put up snarky little quotes and stuff. That was branding. Believe it or not, that was an early form of branding. Screen names were an early form of branding. It was a way of us expressing who we were to people on the internet. And so we were giving people these online personas, or we were giving ourselves these online personas. But the cool thing now is that branding has become a little bit more like, we're not necessarily all hiding behind pretend usernames, and people can be a little bit more transparent about who they are. So after we had social networking, also around that time was, do we remember websites that looked like this? If you were lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go to this site, it's called Cameronsworld.net. This guy, he's a graphic designer, and he actually has this page where you can just scroll endlessly, and it has every horrible thing from early internet. Things blinked, there's middies, there's a little under construction man digging a hole. Every like fandom you can think of is all on this website. So we made these ugly websites, right? I had one, my friends had one. We did our MySpace profiles as well, but that was all, again, ways of sharing our brands and sharing what we were into with people from other areas. So then I graduate college, and like many of us do, I am about to just give up on the slides. 
Okay. I literally just gave this talk two weeks ago when I was not having issues. All right. Anyway. Um, so yeah, early, early personal branding happened on things like AOL, ICQ. So for me, this was around the time that I graduated college and went to Ashland and um, moved up to Toledo and up to Michigan and worked there for a few years and started to rely really heavily on these things. MySpace, Facebook, those came out right as I graduated high school. And for somebody who's moved away from where all their friends and family are, these were great tools for connecting with your existing friends. They were great ways to keep in touch, you know, as people are starting to get like married and have babies and do all that stuff, you can keep track of that from your college friends. What I didn't realize was that all of this playing on social media earlier was going to directly impact my career later on. So I have a degree in philosophy and not the most marketable degree, so I eventually went back to school and got my MBA. And my professor made us make LinkedIn profiles. And we connected with all of our classmates and we connected with current coworkers, so started to build our networks. And so I thought, okay, fine, I'm gonna create this LinkedIn thing for, you know, for this class and I'm not gonna worry about it ever again. But I still was a pretty heavy Facebook and MySpace user. I was actually really hesitant to abandon MySpace for Facebook because I liked all the customization and playing you could do on MySpace that you couldn't on Facebook. So then I moved to Columbus a few years after that. And new city, I wanna find out what's going on in the city. So one of my friends who works in social media marketing and tourism told me to make a Twitter account. And so I made a Twitter account and initially I'm following local businesses, local events, stuff like that, just trying to figure out what's going on in the city. At the time I didn't even use my real name on Twitter. My profile picture was my dog because it was still in that weird time of like keep yourself anonymous behind a screen. Stranger danger. Stranger danger. <laughs> yep, stranger danger. But then I, so I was initially just using Twitter as kind of a news feed almost. But then I got a job in tech. And I started working as a tech recruiter. And when I started in tech, agile and cloud computing were the new hotness. And I didn't want to be the dumb recruiter who didn't know Java and JavaScript are different things. So I decided I would start going to these user groups and meetups to learn about the technologies I was recruiting for. Well, it turns out if you show up to user groups enough times and are engaged and interested, people ask you to host the user groups, sponsor the user groups, speak at the user groups. They, help, they ask you to organize conferences and events. And so eventually, I grew into this place where I was first just attending, and then I was helping organize a Microsoft conference called Dog Food Con. I was the president. I helped found and run a cross-platform cloud computing conference called Cloud Develop. Got all of these really cool opportunities. And in the midst of all of this, I'm still a baby technologist, or baby tech professional. And I see everybody tweeting about some conference by this point, I followed a bunch of developers, and I see everybody tweeting about this conference called CodeMash. Have we all heard of CodeMash, I'm assuming? Not everybody. Okay. So CodeMash is a conference in an indoor water park at the Kalahari and Sandusky in January. It is college meet summer camp for developers. It's amazing. You all should go. I'm actually on the board now, <laughs> so I am the VP of CodeMash now, but yeah, you should go. It's, it's seriously, it's where I got my start as a speaker. It's hands-on workshops, it's events, definitely check it out. But at the time, I wasn't there. My old, one of my employers wouldn't let me go, wouldn't pay for it. And so I just saw all these developers I'd followed from the user groups tweeting about hashtag CodeMash. And I'm like, this CodeMash sounds like I could learn stuff from it. So I clicked on the CodeMash hashtag and followed literally every single programmer. I think Alan was one of them. <laughs> that was tweeting about CodeMash, just because I was curious, just because I was trying to learn. But then again, after time, I started sitting back, I would listen, I would listen to what developers were concerned about when it came to jobs, when it came to career growth, when it came to meetups. And eventually I got a little, like I got braver and I came out of the woodwork and I would actually tweet at people. And sometimes it was something silly, like complimenting, I don't know, a talk that they saw, and sometimes it was giving them advice about a job or something. But again, I've made inroads into that community such that I got to a point where user groups and meetups are looking for recruiters to be at the job panel that the user groups all do once a month. So I started being asked to be on job panels and things. Again, because I 
had established all this stuff on Twitter. About that time, I realized that I could be even more deliberate about this. Because everything I was doing was just kind of random and it kept having these really cool consequences. So I sat back and I'm like, how did I get to this point? What did I do and how can I use my personal brand? So if you have an online presence, you have a personal brand. This is lesson one. I don't care if you don't think you're a brand. I don't care if you don't think you need a brand. If you're online, you are branding yourself and representing yourself in some way to the world. Might as well make it work for you. So personal branding, practice of people marketing themselves and their careers as brands. It is, of course, personal, first and foremost, but it's about brands and benefits. The elements of personal branding, it starts with your online presence, though I would argue that you need to get offline to really have an effective brand. This is an ongoing process. So you never, it's not like one of these things where you can just like publish it and forget it. Like you need to be, maybe not every day, maybe not every week, but you need to be consistently doing things to promote and share and develop your brand. It is self-promotional and this is a good thing. It's a good place for you to be able to talk about the accomplishments and talk about stuff that you've done and talk about things that you're proud of. And I'm finding that people in tech have a very hard time doing this, but you need to be able to speak up your accomplishments and talk about it. And you can do that online to a like-minded audience. It definitely provides career enhancement in so many ways. I've had two or three jobs I've found through Twitter, some of the most interesting speaking opportunities I've had, I've met through Twitter, friends I've met through Twitter. So, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna enhance you in a lot of ways. And it applies in real life. This is really the key is when you take that brand offline with people. We're gonna talk about how to do that. Um, real quick though, why does it matter? Personal branding helps you build a network. It helps you get to know people that you might not otherwise know or meet. I, at this point, have could go to a lot of very large cities and a lot of places and have a friend or two that I know they're from my personal brand from growing my network over time, which is really cool when you find yourself in the middle of nowhere, whether it's Omaha, Nebraska, or Athens, Greece, and you don't know what to do, you have somebody local to tell you where to go and what to do. It helps you establish your expertise as well. No. Helps you establish your expertise. <laughs> I know. I'm an expert, I promise. There's always grimoires. It's well it keeps going like it's taking me out of slideshow mode. I don't know. I I don't like PowerPoint windows. Um but yeah, your brand helps establish yourself as an expert. That's kind of how it worked for me, is that I started to be known as the recruiter who got what people wanted to do and got what communi why community mattered. And finally, it makes you approachable. So I had had people come up to me based on me tweeting pictures of my dogs. I have a pair of corgis, they're adorable. And people will be, you know, maybe intimidated to talk to you or not have something to break the ice, but People think you're approachable if you have something personal, something about yourself that you can share. The other thing is that an effective personal brand, it helps you build trust. It helps you build trust with people. And to this point, to this day, I tell people all the time, when you get in tech, you need to build a brand. You need to not burn bridges. And you need to get to a place where people trust you. And then you need to maintain that trust as well. So in order to build a brand, these next three slides are the most important slides of the whole presentation. They are on my LinkedIn. But basically, when it comes time for you to build a brand, you want to consider kind of three different things about yourself. And this is an exercise that I'm developing it into a workshop. But if you, you know, really want to sit down and start working on this stuff, sit down with pen and paper or your computer or your iPad or whatever and answer these questions and they'll give you the basis for creating your brand content. So first of all, who are you professionally? Technical specialties, obviously a no-brainer. You're good at AI, you're good at .NET, you're good at machine learning, you're good at cloud, you're good at whatever. What are your technical specialties? And write down two or three of those. Then what are your professional specialties? Because, guess what, y'all have skills that aren't just technical. Programmers have a lot of other skills. And so maybe you're somebody who's a good mentor. Maybe you're somebody who's good at, you know, 
marketing initiatives, making sales leads into the company. Maybe you're good at bringing junior developers on. A lot of your other skills that make you a good team member. Maybe you're, just, you're a good teacher. And write down two or three of those. And then your contributions to your team and your profession. What are the two or three things that you're most proud of that you've done in your career that you might want to share with the world and talk about? So for me, a lot of my stuff about contributions revolves around teaching and it revolves around giving back to a community that I've learned a lot from. So that's your, pers or your professional aspect. Once you do that though, it is a personal brand. So you want to do a similar exercise for you personally and this is where it gets a little bit trickier because this is where you decide what about yourself as a human being outside of tech that you might want to share with the world. So you can start with your interests and your hobbies. And this is where stuff can get really cool. I am into um, soccer, I'm into Columbus Crew soccer. And I started tweeting a lot about that. And I started seeing people tweeting about the crew hashtag who were from my tech world. And I was like, oh, there's a bunch of tech people that are also into Columbus Crew soccer. I'm gonna invite those people to come to my soccer tailgate. And I founded a geek tailgate. And it wound up being 30 to 40 nerds in a parking lot geeking out about Agile and cloud computing and whatever else <laughs> over beer and burgers. It was great. It was wonderful. We still have several of the geek tailgaters. But that was just like two of my interests collided and social media brought them together. So interests, hobbies, whatever you're into, that's something that you want to share with others. And then what are your beliefs and your values that you want to share? So for me, I'm very, I think, Diversity, equity, and inclusion is important. I think representation is important. So those are the sorts of kind of more value and belief-based things that uh, help me determine what accounts I follow and help me determine what content I'll tweet or I'll create. And then as far as like your social, family, and community life goes, this can be things like maybe you're looking for other people who have kids the same age or they have the same kind of pet as you or they're training for the same race or something like that. Like there's a lot of different things that you're doing personally that other people are doing. So if you write down, you know, two or three connection points around those things, they can help you find your communities and create your brand. So professional, personal, there's a third part. Then you need to think about how you can connect with people. So this is where you identify your shared interests. This is where hashtags are really, really important. This is where that code mesh hashtag, that crew 96 hashtag, this is where they benefited me. And you start to find your shared interests and then those are the people that you want to connect with initially. Now in order to connect with people, there are a lot of different things you can do. You can ask advice or opinions. Only ask advice about things that you actually want advice about though. Um, but people, I'm always forever seeing people in tech Twitter tweeting like, oh, I'm trying to solve this problem. What platform do you use? What streaming? Like there's a lot of talk right now about streaming tools. What do you use for your streaming tools? Um, during pandemic, there was a lot of people asking and answering advice around work from home equipment for people who weren't already working from home. So that's all the sorts of stuff that you can ask people on the internet. Um, sometimes I'll just do a, hey, like what did you all think of X? and that'll get people to talk to you. Questions on the internet get people to engage. And then asking people about themselves. This is another one of my favorite tricks when I follow somebody new or I connect with somebody <coughs> at a conference, I'll connect with them then online and I'll ask them a question, maybe what got you into this thing? What's your favorite part of this? What was your favorite conference session? Just something to get a conversation going that people can answer that's about themselves because People like to talk about themselves and talking about yourself as part of building a brand. You gotta decide which social platforms work for you. The number of times I've had to change the little icons up here, I eventually gave up and I'm just like, this is where we are. <laughs> but there's so many of them, so many. So you have to decide what works best for you. Um, one thing that I found interestingly enough lately is I was doing some research for work about our social strategy and nowadays, more and more content, as we probably all know, is going to short form video. So your Instagram reels, your TikToks, all those things. Like there are people who make professional names. There's a Microsoft MVP who is a TikToker, and that's how she's made her name as an MVP. Her name is Miss Excel. She's awesome. She gives TikToks with, you know, Excel tricks. 
But there's all this cool stuff out there. And so when I was looking at social platforms most recently, the reels and the videos are really what's winning at content right now to the point that one of the executives at Google admitted that Instagram and TikTok are beating Google in su certain search categories wow. around venues and events. Wow. Yep. With Gen Z. And Gen Z's coming into the workforce now. But yeah, I was like, Google's admitting that they're being beat in search by Instagram? <laughs> Crazy. So yeah, there's a lot of different platforms out there. For me, I'm not on the video stuff yet. I need to pivot and learn it right now. I'm not there. The other thing is that it's important to diversify your platforms because I'm sure we all know that Twitter is struggling. <laughs> uh, I've seen a lot of exodus from Twitter. I myself am moving more and more over to a platform called Blue Sky now. Has anybody heard of Blue Sky? Um, Twitter founder basically built another Twitter type thing. Um, and invites are going out slowly and so I, I'm starting to establish Blue Sky and right now a lot of my Blue Sky community is people in tech. So, Cool thing is I got in there early enough that I got just my first name as a username. Yeah, Cassandra Blue Sky. So you gotta decide what platforms work for you. So here's kind of how I use my platforms. Twitter, um, you can see this is a picture. I put a lot of time into my screenshots, into everything, like my header pictures, all those things. I put a lot of time into those. So on my Twitter profile, you see a cover photo, and that's my geek tail. Those are my techie people. And then you have my profile picture, which changes as my hair color changes sometimes. <laughs> um, I use this little emoji cluster and set of phrases everywhere, pretty much. So it says, you know, focused on the human side of tech, board gamer, stir scholarship president, um, what else, traveler, all sorts of different things that I'm very much into. And then when I'm at conferences and events, I'll actually put the name of the event in my name on Twitter because then when you search the conference on Twitter, your name shows up and people follow you and talk to you. So that's Twitter. For me, the important thing is to know your hashtag. First thing I do whenever I go to an event is I look for the hashtag. And then one mistake that a lot of people made with Twitter, made my social media to be helpful, I want it to be obviously real, but I want it to be a place that's helpful, that's more positive than not, that is a place where I feel supported and affirmed as a person, that makes it easier and safer for me. Like, I don't understand this mindset of people following accounts that they're just going to complain about or be threatened by. If you don't like it, just don't follow it. <laughs> it's not that hard. But that's, that's how you keep yourself psychologically safe. Mistakes. Nothing on the internet is private. I don't care what your privacy settings are. I don't care what, how locked down you have everything. Nothing on the internet is private. So, if you're sharing stuff, even under friends of request, make sure it's stuff that you wouldn't mind getting out into the public, you know, into the public world. Like I've had this happen a couple of times with like Halloween or like costume parties. I'm like, do I want to share this picture? And I was like, sure, it's harmless. But you know, it's, it's again, your comfort level. Knowing that it could be screenshot, but also knowing I'm dressed as Little Red Riding Hood or whatever. It's not that big of a deal. Don't share too much information. This is, I don't want to hear the contents of your baby's diaper on social media. I don't want to hear all of the gory details of your breakup or your divorce that you're going through. Like, keep that stuff private. It's okay to share that you're going through a major life event. I went through a divorce that devastated me. But... I didn't share a lot about it. I just basically shared a little bit about it, but I didn't go into detail. I just shared that I was no longer with my ex, all of that stuff. But there's a way to do it without dragging people into your unnecessary drama. And then it's noisy. There's a lot of social media noise. And so again, this is where unfollow mute comes in. I am starting to really like the for you feature on Twitter because it's pulling people that it doesn't just pull people that I interact with regularly, but it is pulling up people that I don't necessarily see all the time. And so I'm starting to engage with them, but make sure that you're, you know, making sure that your social media is useful for you. It is so easy to waste time on social media, especially when social media is a piece of your job. I handle this by time boxing, um, with varying degrees of discipline, but I usually like first thing in the morning, I'm checking my social media. I want to know what's happening in the community that day. I want to know if something major broke, just whatever goes on. So I check my social media pretty early in the day, and I have the first hour of my day blocked off to do that. 
and then I try to keep it put away throughout the workday and only check it a couple times a day rather than uh, every time I get a notification or something. So you just, it's time management. And you're never going to be caught up. I remember I used to feel like I had to read every single blog post on Google Reader, tweet on my timeline, <laughs> Facebook post. Like I remember I used to think I had to read it all because, oh my God, what if I miss something? But you know what? I miss lots of stuff and that's fine. So you're never going to be caught up on social media. Don't try. If there are certain people that you really like to engage with or follow, make it a point to check them You know, regularly. You can put together lists of people or groups to keep track on stuff, but you're not going to be caught up all the time. Now, great, online branding, but this is the key. It's the offline branding. And this is where we really, really get to create your brand. And there is a process to this. It's not as random as it seems. It's not as happenstance as it seems. So I'm a developer, and I'm going to conduct today. I'm going to go on Twitter and go, hey, I'm going to the conduct meetup tonight. Who else am I going to see there? Or whatever event it is, or whatever user group or meetup. Ask that. Then you plan to meet up. This is one of my favorite tricks for conferences, especially conferences where I don't know a lot of people. Several years back, I think it was in Nashville at Music City Tech, and I tweeted, hey, you know, Music City Tech, I'm here and I'm looking for somebody to have dinner with who's in hashtag Music City Tech. And like four people responded to me. I didn't know any of them. But we all wound up meeting together for dinner and now one's a really good friend of mine. I hired another one at one point. Like you just, you never know. and it's. At conferences and events, there's always other people who are there alone, and they're just looking for somebody to let out that invite. Connect with new people online after events, during events. It's become extremely easy on certain platforms. LinkedIn even has a QR code feature where you can, in the search box, pull up a QR code to connect with people. Um, when I connect with people that way, I'll try to pay attention to the date that I connected with them so I can tie them to whatever event I met them at. But connect with people online after events and don't just connect with them. Every event you go to, there's going to be one or two people that you really click with. And you maybe have a really good conversation or you share something with one another. There's something there. That person or those people are the people you're going to DM, email, message afterwards. And say, hey, I really liked chatting about, I'm trying to think of this. Actually, I was looking for an invite to Blue Sky. And I mentioned it at a speaker dinner and then. Uh, a few days later, another speaker DMs me and is like, hey, I knew you were looking for a blue sky invite, here you go. Like it's just, it's a, it's just a way to connect with people. And it's just a way to keep those conversations going so that you can just talk to those really interesting people. Helping people. Helping people is the key to having a personal brand because developer communities are something special. They're a community that we rely on. We have a lot of very intelligent people in the Midwest, stereotypically friendly people who are really excited about really cool, nerdy stuff. And so we all want to share our knowledge and share our experience and share opportunities and any number of things. And so helping people doesn't have to be some great big, I hired you and gave you a job. Helping somebody can be, oh, you know that blog post that I just read about this new JavaScript framework? Here, I'll send it to you. Little, little gestures. I do, that, I do that one a lot, like I'll people who are asking for information about an event or something that I can inform them on and I'll just send them a link and that's all the help you need to give. And then you just keep doing it. Like I said, it doesn't have to be every day, but it needs to be a somewhat regular process. How I manage it is it's actually really event dependent, so when I have a lot of events, I'm a lot more vocal and noisy and active on social media and then I take a break. Like the weekend after a conference, I usually just completely unplug because I need a break. And you want to take the break, but you don't want to completely abandon the platforms. And if after you know a few months you find that one of the social platforms isn't working for you, or the content's not working for you, or the people you're connecting with aren't right, there's a million other platforms or other brand approaches you can take. So I like to say this emoji is me, or this slide is me in emoji. Being yourself is the key. So online me, very bubbly, very friendly, very outgoing, a little colorful. Offline me, pretty much the same person. 
Um, I'll find me is probably a little bit more snarky and cynical, but not that much. But it's this, it's the same person. And that actually helps people, again, want to connect with you and want to help you because they see who you are online as who you actually are in real life. And they can relate to you better that way. Like I said, helping other people is the absolute best thing you can do for your brand. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be somebody's looking for a new earbuds and you can send them a link to the earbuds. Like it's just little silly stuff, but people remember that. With that, I'm happy to take questions. Apologies for all of the PowerPoint issues, but glad to take some questions. I am at Cassandra Ferris everywhere on the internet except Blue Sky. I'm <laughs> Cassandra.bluesky. But, um, but yeah, that's me. I work casting by Veeam. We do Kubernetes data backup and recovery. And that's it. Yeah, blogging is the same, blogging, streaming, YouTube, all the same approach. Those three slides with the questions can help you decide what you might want to blog about. You actually, doing this for work, I have a, I went through not quite those exact slides, but very similar to talk about, well, these are the things that I want to blog about as I'm learning Kubernetes. And so then you have that as the start, and then you can break it out into like, I'm going to have a three part, you know, Kubernetes learning journey, blog series. So it's the same thing. It's just, you know, it can help you give some direction when there's so many things you might want to blog about. You know, what's the most exciting thing to you is honestly, because I see this thing in tech where people feel like they need to blog about whatever the flavor of the week JavaScript framework is. But if you're not excited about that, don't. Blog about what you're excited about. Blog about what you're interested in. Even if you think it's old and outdated, because I don't know how many people I know who are like, oh, I have this blog post five years ago that I wrote on this getting started with whatever, and people still visit it on a daily basis. Like, you never know. So, so yeah, share what you know. Yeah. If you have, to say, an old blog, I wouldn't. I wouldn't delete it. I wouldn't revive it. I actually have a abandoned blog. I would just start updating it again. Yeah. I mean, if you want to do a, like, hey, I'm back sort of thing or something, but... Yeah, I wouldn't delete it. Unless, of course, it's, you know, you're blogging about COBOL development and you don't want to write COBOL. Something like that, you know, that's, that's when you'd want to delete it. I, well, I was a tech recruiter. And so I have a different perspective on LinkedIn because of that. It's nothing bad, it's just like, LinkedIn is not where software developers are hanging out, really. So if you're trying to connect with software developers, it's not the right platform. And there are so many spammy recruiters. I get them. I get people who try to hire me to be a .NET developer all the time. <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. I've, I've actually responded, back in the day, I would respond and be like, oh, what a coincidence. I'm hiring for the same role. <laughs> no, you know, good luck. But so it's not that I don't like LinkedIn, it's just that it's not as useful for me as a platform as Twitter where my engagement can be more organic. Um, that said, I am starting to see, especially as I move into leadership more, I'm starting to use LinkedIn a little bit more to share accomplishments and achievements and have some conversations. But it's, the other mistake I made with LinkedIn early on is I connected with everybody, not realizing I should be more selective. And so it kind of dilutes the usefulness of your network that way. Uh, that's why I, it's an, I mean, that's why I say it's a necessary evil. Like, it's a great place to showcase things you don't show on a resume. It's a great place to showcase your projects. It's just not the platform that works best for me. If you need blogging on LinkedIn, turn on creator mode it really helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is a good a LinkedIn trick for people, too, or people who are starting to get, um, wanting to get started in blogging. Write a... It's easiest if you just left an event or a conference or something, but you can write a, like, highlights of the conference blog post as your first blog post. I've seen a lot of people do that as well to get started. And sometimes people will send them to be like, hey, Cassandra, I did this. I was like, awesome, I'm glad, now keep going. <laughs> so. What's your take on cross-posting? I know LinkedIn can help you also cross-post your Twitter account. Do you ever view it that way, or do you say, well, I'm going to do local stuff on LinkedIn, or is that what you're It depends. I cross-post a lot. I'm a big believer in <laughs> creating content takes a long time. Mm -hmm. Why not reuse it? Like, you can take a YouTube video and break it into reels and turn it into a blog. There's all these different things that you can do. So sometimes I cross post. Um, sometimes I'll post a little bit different wording on things. The only thing about 
I don't usually, I don't cross post as much as I copy and paste. So the same thing I posted today on Twitter about speaking here, I posted on LinkedIn, but I copy pasted it so that I could tag the right user groups, the right meetups, the right conferences, because the usernames aren't the same on every platform. Uh, but everything on Instagram pretty much, it cross posts automatically to Facebook, and some of that stuff goes on Twitter, some doesn't. It just depends on what you share, but definitely cross posting, scheduling tools, all that stuff, use it, it makes your life easier. Um. For somebody who's uh, you know, looking to first start to get a little bit, or maybe they're in between roles, like how important is leveraging social media and like networks? And do you have any recommendations on what to do? Like, uh, and like what kind of uh, content you should be posting? Yes, I have a whole talk on that called "It's Okay to Talk to Strangers." <laughs> do you have it <laughs> what? Do you have it recorded? Probably somewhere on YouTube. It's old, okay. but it's, I started. It was my first ever talk, but. Um, but yeah, you do, the best thing you can do is be here, right, in this room. Not even kidding. Be at the user groups, be at the meetups, be at the conferences, connect with people in real life. That's really where you start finding jobs, especially as you start. It's not like, I mean, every once in a while you get lucky and you show up to the meetup and somebody's hiring and you want that job. That's rare. This is one of many steps, but you come to events like this enough times and people start to see you and they think, oh, that person must be, you know, if not a good, the person's at least a very engaged software developer, if not a good one. I tended to, when I was a recruiter, I would assume if people were involved in user groups and meetups, they would get bumped up the, the priority ranking because I knew they were involved in the community and I knew that the company I worked for valued community involvement. So do that um, online share that you're searching for a job. LinkedIn, actually, I do like LinkedIn jobs feature, but share that you're searching for a job, share your content. Um, if you're looking for a certain type of role, I see this a lot in my world, in DevRel world, where people will be like, oh, I'm looking for a job so I can, you know, promote this sort of platform or tool or whatever. Here's some samples of work I've done in that area, and they'll share it online. So, but definitely leverage your, your social networks on and offline. So you said a word a second ago, DevRel. Oh. A little bit more relevant. oh, developer relations. Yeah, it's what's the, that mean? It's what I do for a living. It's the intersection of people who build products, use products, and um, build products, use products, and like contribute to products and sell the products. So I work between Caston's open source community, our Kubernetes learning platform called Cube, Cube Campus, and then our uh, Beam users community as well. And I work with both, all of those communities. For one end of it, that means teaching. For another piece of it that means working at conference booths, if I was a what's called a developer advocate, which is the other kind of developer relations job, I would be doing a lot of product demos and creating demos and creating interesting talks about the stuff that my company's products do. I'm just on the people side of that. It, it's, a, it's a chaotic job and it's cool and I love it, but it's definitely, it's so different everywhere. I know DevRel, I, let's see, as a DevRel person, I've managed an open source community I've done a lot of Twitch streaming. <laughs> it's just, it just depends on the job and the company. I managed Microsoft MVPs most recently, helping them find speaking engagements and auditing their contributions. So a lot of different stuff. But it's a really it's a growing area. There, it's to the point where they're starting to have developer relations internally as well to kind of be focused on developer careers or developer growth and skill growth inside as well as outside. Uh, with the uh, blue sky, is that uh, uh, basically a uh, uh, more of like uh, a uh, uh, social media platform, like similar to LinkedIn, or is it uh, kind of more if we went to Twitter? It looks uh, an awful lot like Twitter. Yeah, exactly. It's made by the founder. Um, like, I, my screen's not sharing, but it looks like a Twitter feed. When you go into Blue Sky, you can't see it that well. I don't why is it? But yeah, it just looks like a Twitter feed. It doesn't support hashtags yet, which is a frustration. But that's all. And then they send you, like every few weeks, they send you an invite code to bring more people in. But right now, there's a thing in tech Twitter that it's not just Midwest tech Twitter. It just seems to be a thing in tech Twitter that we're all passing invite codes along to others as we get our invite codes to get, get more people in there. So, so uh, that's something like uh, Blue Sky. Is that, uh, uh, available on like all devices, or is it? Uh... Yeah, yeah, and it's still in early stages. Like the URL is staging.bsky.app, 
if you just go to like bsky.app, it puts you on. You have to put on put your name on a waiting list to get an invite code. Um, but I know that eventually they're going to make it more open. It's just just starting. And I mean, it could this could be a mistake. It could explode. It could be that Blue Sky isn't the new Twitter. But a bunch of us are hedging our bets that it is, and we're going to try it for now because it's worth a shot. The worst thing that happens is it doesn't work. Anybody else? I actually didn't know that you were all working the web. That's awesome. That I was what? I didn't know that you were all working the web, so that was good. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I have a question about getting garnering a, uh, a handle. So I see you're Cassandra dot Ferris. Mm -hmm. You're Cassandra Ferris on Twitter. Yeah. And it's Cassandra Underbar Parisa on Twitter. Yeah. Um, I think on Facebook I'm Dennis Dunn five eighty one. Yeah. But on Twitter I'm Enzo Fox. Is that a is that a problem? Do you think? It depends on you. I know people who have usernames that. Like my friend Christina Aldon, all her stuff is branded under Lucky Girly Girl everywhere, um, rather than Christina. But I know, I can't think of their name, but I have another friend who, some of his stuff is branded with his name and some is branded with his username. And it's the trick it there is that it just, it can make it a little more complicated because you have to tie all those networks together. Um, I'm seeing people start to put, especially on Twitter and LinkedIn, I'm seeing people start to put their other social connections or social platforms on there so people can connect. But I don't think it's a problem. I do think it adds an extra layer of challenge. So I am Cassandra like, Foote. Cassandra, you mean like Cassandra Ferris on all your platforms? Yep, with no punctuation or anything. Well, I wanted, I really wanted at Cassandra. And it was sitting empty on Twitter for a long, long time. Like it was just a dead account. And I would stalk it and stalk it and stalk it. And then and every few months I'd look at at Cassandra on Twitter. And then one day the stupid NoSQL database got it for me. <laughs> oh. and, I, and it like sat idle for years. I was so mad. I was so mad. So, but I, I mean, I'm fortunate too that I have a unique name. But like, um, some of my friends who don't have such unique names, they use other handles. I like. I think the SQL community does a really cool job with this stuff. So a lot of the people in the SQL community, their username is. SQL flip flops because they always wear flip flops. SQL espresso because they worked at a coffee company. SQL corgi because that's their dog. Like, I think that's a fun branding formula that that particular community uses that I don't really see <coughs> a whole lot else. I'm starting to see some of it in DevOps as well. A handful of people are doing playing with the name DevOps. So it's not more like a consistency across platforms. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, there are there are people in tech, a couple in cybersecurity and a couple in other areas who don't use their real name or their real face anywhere, but they still have managed to create this brand. <coughs> but if you get them to one place, then you can branch out from there. Exactly. Yep. Then I want to throw up ten yeah. ten links just one. Yeah. And, and you can get it everywhere else from there. Yep, and for professional purposes, LinkedIn's probably your best hub for that, unless that's not the approach you want to take. So, I, I blog about knowledge management, and I also have like a personal profile website about me, like Jeffrey Hill at gmail.net or Jeffrey Hill mm -hmm. at or, and I'm in knowledgebusiness.com. So, is it bad to be topical, or should you focus on like yourself as a person? Which is I think it's, I'm human first. Okay. So like when I'm up here, I'm a, I'm a human, I'm Cassandra Ferris, I'm a community manager first, and then I'm a DevOps cast and community manager. So I lead with the person the end of the personal brand. The personal brand, yeah, the human side of tech. Okay. Um, there's a few reasons for that. One is it's my area of expertise, but there's another where I've seen, as a recruiter, you see a lot of hiring managers who like to talk about programmers as if they are interchangeable coder robots. Matt's probably heard me say this a thousand times. Um, and so what I started to do is I wanted to focus on the human aspect of that. And so I wanted people to focus on, well, I have these other skills, I have these other abilities, I have other things I can do other than just write all the .NET code. Um, but then also you, you know, you want to together. Like right? cross-posting and sharing links and stuff is all helpful. 
I know there's things like Linktree and stuff too that some people use to good effect for putting all their platforms in one place. It's helpful too in case you're like <clears throat> you're specialized in something and that thing goes away or you get a new job and you're now like completely different specialization. Why should I still follow you? You're completely different. Yeah. But they still might follow you anyway because they like you as a person. Yes. I have lots of people following me even though I don't recruit anymore and they still will sometimes ask me about jobs and I'll be like, how's it? Did you see these people? I don't care about the crew and I enjoy your posts about them. So yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I, and I will, I will periodically, that is one thing that I'll do is every once in a while, especially like the beginning of crew season or right before a big thing like Code Nash, I'll be like, hey, soccer friend, sorry, there's going to be a lot of tech or vice versa. <laughs> Nobody ever unfollows me over that, but just like, hey, heads up, I came for this content, you're also going to get that. And if you follow all my stuff, then you see corgi pictures too. I actually, that's one of the things I would love about your, your talks. I know I'm going to get to see talks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the mental health talks now, I just use pictures of my dog yeah, it's great. to illustrate it's my great. mental health talks. Is those so. your dogs up there? Yeah, those are, oh. yeah, you can't see them that well. The three colored one's Katie, and then the other one's Pippin. Katie because she's Catherine, a royal name. Pippin because corgis are the hobbits of the dog world. <laughs> <laughs> Bird Beach, Short Lake, what to eat? Um, you mentioned that you don't use these software developers on LinkedIn. So, mm -hmm. what's the uh, like platform that you recommend that people use? I, I still see developers hanging out on Twitter and Blue Sky, and then there's a lot of it's. I mean, there's like Twitch and Discord as well are also places, but those are harder because you have to know where to look. Yeah. Um, but. There's still a bunch of us who are very hesitant to leave Twitter because that's where everybody is, and so I this is where I'm curious to see if Blue Sky takes over or if we all just stick with Twitter. I just want to be there. If you're interested in a job in Denver, for example, do you wait until you have a strong brand before you actually apply for those jobs, or you could you just take the leap if it's something that really interests you? You don't need to, but it helps. For internal DevRel, it matters less if you're doing DevRel for you know, your employees. But it definitely helps because there's a lot of there's a lot of jobs, but there's also a lot of competition for those jobs because they're they're not as glamorous as they look, but my job is very fun. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. It is very fun. It's interesting. I get to do a lot of stuff, work on interesting problems. But having a strong personal brand will help you with it. Um, if you don't have that, you need something whether it's a portfolio, whether it's a history of talks, whether it's blogs, some sort of content that you can show an employer that says, hey, I can share this. Because the other important piece of being in DevRel, especially on the more technical end of it, is being able to explain technical concepts to people who aren't technical necessarily. I've, I've seen one or two people get into DevRel as like their first job. Yeah. It's, it's, an, it's That's a different one. Yeah. They tend to be very interesting people too. Yeah. They also often have degrees in marketing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. But yeah, yeah, there is, there's, I'm, I'm starting to see like entry level DevRel jobs, which yeah. wasn't a thing because it's such a newer profession yeah. that you know we're all kind of making it up as we go. Yeah. There's, there's literally, I think there's three books now about developer relations that exist. There's just not a lot out there. There's, there's a lot of, but the cool thing about it is that it means that a lot of us are very. Collaborative, like I'm working with three other companies to create labs for Cube Campus, even though we all work for different companies. So, it just depends. Oh, well, right. Well, this is one last question. Yeah, uh, on LinkedIn, it seems like most people put the city on this of their examples. Mm -hmm. I guess that takes you to Twitter. No, I don't think so. I think it's whatever you want. If you're putting it up there, I mean, I guess, why are you putting it up there? Like, I mean, I would, I think I might have a picture of the Columbus skyline actually on my now defunct blog. But it just depends why you're doing it. Is Do you want it to, do you want your LinkedIn profile to highlight that you're a Columbus person? Then yes, put Columbus on your cover photo. If not, then maybe don't put it. <laughs> is that a default thing, maybe? It, it got sent to me by my company, and they said, we, we yeah, went through this whole branding thing with mm -hmm. our marketing department, yeah. and and they, and they said, here, put this, make this your thing, and, and do this, and, and here's, your, here's your background, and they put you on, and, and it's Columbus, it's centric from the top. Yep. I didn't even know. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, we're going to be done okay. asking Cassandra questions, but we're going to start just yeah. entering the last part for the remainder of the weekend. Before we do that, uh, I have a Jet Rain's license to go away, so raise your hand if you're interested.